Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I'm your host, the Wilder Historian, Dr. Lucas Wilder, and last time, Washington became the commander of the Continental Army. Now we join him as he attempts to hold the army together. If you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to the channel, join the Patreon page, or purchase something from the Teespring store or Etsy shop. Every little bit helps. Thank you. Washington saw the troops whose enlistments were up march away, but he did use his power as the commander to call up 5,000 militiamen from Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Amazingly, by the end of December, about half of the army re-enlisted. Washington couldn't understand how anyone couldn't re-enlist, but he had also never been the owner of a small farm without the benefit of slave labor or indentured servants to work the land in their stead. Many of these soldiers were farmers from the countryside, and every day spent away from home could mean ruin for their families. To make matters worse, Congress increased the pay of officers while it cut the salary of enlisted men by nearly 25%. That winter, Washington set about making sure his men were as comfortable as possible, even when his wife visited for a couple weeks before the holidays. The Army consumed 117 cords of wood each day for the yield of about four acres of forest. Washington made sure that units were detached for gathering wood and bringing it over the icy and muddy roads of New England. Many of the men lived in barracks, which had been constructed at the orders of their commander back when the weather was warm. Now they would remain warm even through these winter months. Disease was the biggest threat to Washington's army that winter. Refugees from Boston were prevented from wandering into camp, required to have passes if they passed within the confines of the camp. To prevent the spread of smallpox, visitors from outbreak areas were banned from visiting the army, and soldiers who expressed symptoms were quarantined. Any letters from Boston were to be dipped in vinegar before they could be read to adhere to hygienic practices and warding off disease. Although the army was surviving the winter surrounding Boston, the attack on Canada did not go as planned. Richard Montgomery and Benedict Arnold, the two men leading the two-pronged invasion of Canada, attacked Quebec City, but the attack failed, leaving Montgomery killed and Arnold wounded. Despite the reenlistments, his army was still depleted, and worse, the men that were there had few weapons. The officers had failed to retrieve the muskets from the men who left when their enlistments were up. They left with their government-issued weapons. Now the new soldiers were without. Also, the lack of gunpowder to fire the muskets still plagued Washington's army. Still, Congress and the American people were disheartened by Washington's passivity. They wanted him to attack the British in Boston. The commander held a council of war and brought up the idea of attacking the British fortifications. They agreed, but only if they were reinforced with more men and weaponry. Washington ordered 13 regiments from New England to report for 60 days' service beginning February 1st. His subordinates knew that more weapons were on the way. In the fall, Washington ordered his head of artillery, Henry Knox, to go to Fort Ticonderoga and bring back cannons and ammunition. The miraculous journey of Knox's artillery being brought through the winter weather to Washington around Boston stands as one of the great feats of military history. When Knox made it to Cambridge, Washington was overjoyed that the 50 pieces of artillery that he anticipated was increased by the efforts of Knox to around 60. With his added numbers and weapons assembled, Washington called another council of war. A direct assault on Boston was advised against because these new recruits would have to advance across the frozen Charles River, and Washington didn't think that those men would stand and fight in the open. It was eventually decided to take Dorchester Heights, fortify it, and force the British to attack them. Beginning on March 2, 1776, Henry Knox's artillery bombarded the city for a few hours each evening for two nights. On the third night, a more immense bombardment rang out from the Patriots' lines, and Washington's troops advanced and took the heights that the British had failed to secure the entire winter and threw up an impressive set of breastworks within a few hours. By gaining the high ground, Washington believed that the British general would have to attack, and with his men protected behind the fortifications, the Patriots could hold off a British attack. But no attack came. On March 8th, General Howe, the British general, through select men from Boston, came to Washington informing the American general that if he allowed the British fleet into Boston Harbor and not fire on them from Dorchester Heights, then Howe would evacuate Boston. However, if Washington fired on the ships, then Howe would raise Boston to the ground. Washington believed that not only would the British retreat be seen as a defeat, Britain may keep enough dignity that they may end the hostilities. 
Day after day dragged on, but Howe wasn't leaving. It worried Washington. Had he made a mistake? The winter had already depressed him. He even regretted taking charge of the army, saying if things go badly, he may just go into the back country and live in a wigwam. Finally, on March 17, 1776, the Patriots saw British soldiers in formation on the wharves in Boston. The ships were coming in to transport the Redcoats out of the city. British soldiers had occupied Boston for almost seven years, but now it was over. When the last boat left, Washington sent 500 men who could verify their immunity to smallpox into the city first to make sure the British had indeed left. They reported back that the city was in better shape than they had imagined. Now that Boston was safe, the next step would be to determine where the British would land to open up another phase of the war. Washington worried about New York, so he dispatched General Charles Lee to the city to subdue the Loyalists and fortify it. Soon, Washington would take the army to New York City to join Lee, but when he arrived, he found that Lee was reassigned by Congress to the Southern Department, and the building of fortifications had basically stopped when Lee left the city. New York's political climate was vastly different than New England. There were far more Loyalists, and people who declined to pick a side called fence-sitters. Also, the city contained taverns, brothels, and other ways for young men to get into trouble. It would be difficult to keep the Continental soldiers ready for combat amidst the luxuries of the city. Washington's workload became overwhelming. He wrote, I give in to no kind of amusements, but are confined from morn till eve. Despite his military problems, Washington became sure of himself and his troops as he occupied New York City. He had faith in the placement of General Lee's fortifications. Washington would set off for Pennsylvania to meet with the Congress in Philadelphia, where he would lobby for more troops and money, and for equipment and supplies. Another reason for going to Philadelphia was that the commanding general wanted his aid back, Joseph Reed. Reed left Washington's army in the fall of 1775 to continue his law practice, which if he wasn't there, would fail to produce any money for his family to live on. Washington begged Reed to come back repeatedly, but Reed insisted that he would help with the summer campaign in 1776, but he needed to be home the rest of the time to take care of his family and the law practice. When Horatio Gates was promoted, the position of adjutant general was now open. Washington wagered that if he gave that position to Reed, that the increase in pay would be enough to keep Reed by his side. It worked. Congress approved of the man's appointment, and Reed accepted. Washington was overjoyed. Reed had spent many hours with the general that summer of 1775 and gotten to know him very well, probably the person closest to the general during the war years. Also in Philadelphia, Washington met with Congress on two separate occasions. His strategy for defending New York was for the British to pay for every inch of ground they secured, hoping to wear down the British army. Congress was receptive to his pleas for more men, and called up thousands of more troops for the war effort. Congress was also taking more steps toward independence. They opened their ports to nations outside of Great Britain, and formed a committee in June to construct a Declaration of Independence. The movement had now become more than just fighting back against taxes and ill treatment by the British. It was now a war for independence. Washington returned to New York City, and in late June, the sales of British ships were spotted. The summer campaign had begun. Martha was sent back to Philadelphia, and Washington prepared his troops for the upcoming campaign. The general grasped the importance of the moment. He told his troops that the next few weeks would determine whether Americans are to be freemen or slaves. The fate of unborn millions depended on his army, he continued, sounding more like Thomas Paine than himself. The choice was stark. Conquer or die. The eyes of all our countrymen are now upon us, and we shall have their blessings and praises. Confidence in his army began to wane as desertions rose. Punishments were doled out, but they did not stem the tide of men leaving the army. Officers against Washington's orders led pillaging expeditions, causing the general to fear that the New York populace would fear the Patriot Army more than the British Army and aid the British in taking over the city. Worse yet, a plot was uncovered. Sergeant Thomas Hickey, a Continental soldier and a member of Washington's guard, was in jail for passing counterfeit bills. His cellmate overheard him talking with others about a plan to kidnap and kill Washington. The cellmate informed others, and Hickey would be court-martialed, found guilty of mutiny and sedition, and sentenced to death. Before a crowd of 20,000 people, mostly soldiers, Hickey was hanged for his crimes, showing the cost of disloyalty to the American cause. 
Threats of mutiny were the least of Washington's worries. The British fleet sailed past the batteries guarding New York City's harbor and to the Hudson River. Sir Henry Clinton brought reinforcements to General Howe, and foreign mercenaries were expected any day. The British would be able to field 30,000 men. Washington's army was outnumbered. The total reporting for duty was a little over 10,000. To make matters even worse, the Canadian theater was seeing Patriot defeats again. The commander would be replaced by Horatio Gates in the hopes that he could manage the northern theater of operations better. Washington asked for more artillery from the defenses around Boston and prepared to act when General Howe made his first move. 